it was incredible. It was scary and it was amazing. And, and it really opened my eyes to how many possibilities there are in life when it comes to a career and finding a way to do work that you truly love. This is the Building a Lifestyle Business Podcast, where we inspire solopreneurs like you to win back your life by teaching you how to build businesses that maximize your freedom, flexibility, and income, all without trading time for money. Here's your host, Nick Murphy. Hey, my friend, and welcome to the Building a Lifestyle Business Podcast. My name is Nick Murphy, and I'm your host. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really thankful that each and every one of you have taken time out of your busy day to spend some of it with me. I know there's no shortage of things you could be listening to right now on that app of yours. So I'm thrilled that you found the show and even more thrilled that you've given it a second to listen. For you new listeners, go ahead and take a second and press subscribe on whatever app it is you're listening to the show on right now to make sure that you never miss an episode. Speaking of episodes, on every episode you listen to, there's, there's likely to be at least one resource or a link or a discount code to a cool new tool, something that you're going to want to get your hands on. When that happens, just head over to nickmurphy.io, click the podcast link at the top of the page, and that's where you'll find the best show notes in the business. All of our show notes come complete with all the resource links, timestamp show notes, and of course, ways to connect with each and every guest. So if you find yourself, I, I know most people, I, I listen to podcasts when I'm at the gym or I'm in the car, not in front of a computer. But when you find that moment where you're like, gosh, I, I don't have a second to write that down. I really want to go to it. One place you got to go anytime, nickmurphy.io, click the podcast link. Everything you need is right there. Today's guest is Sarah Gregg, and Sarah has an incredible story. In our conversation, she shares what made her decide to walk away from the safety of success, the steps she took to build her business, and what living life as a digital nomad for a few years was actually like. As always, there's a ton to cover, so let's get right into my conversation with Sarah Gregg. My guest today is Sarah Gregg. Sarah is a certified NLP practitioner and accredited business coach with a background in psychology. She's the founder of The Power to Reinvent, a company entirely focused on helping busy professionals prioritize what matters most so they can lead a meaningful and fulfilled life. In 2016, Sarah sold her house, her car, and all her stuff to become a fully location-independent entrepreneur and design her dream lifestyle. Sarah, I'm thrilled to have you. How are you? I'm great, Nick, and it's a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited to take part in this podcast today. I'm excited to have you. So let's, let's just to start, tell my listeners a little bit more about your business and kind of what you do today, and then I really do want to focus the majority of our conversation on your story because it's, it's pretty incredible. Yeah, thanks. So um, I set up in November 2017 um, a business called The Power to Reinvent, which was really taking my background in psychology, NLP, and coaching and channeling it through my passion based on my own experience, which was how in our frantic lifestyle can we prioritize what's most important to us so that we can live a life of meaning and fulfillment. And I do that through a variety of different ways, ranging from one-to-one -one coaching to speaking events to group workshops. Presently, I'm actually working on my first book, which is a model on how to find your flow in everyday life, which is really exciting and literally for me, a dream come true. I love it. You certainly live the life that would inspire kind of writing a book, but you really do. You've practiced what you preached and the rest of this conversation, I really just want to focus on your story. So rewinding the clock a little bit, what was life like for you in 2016? On the surface and to everyone around me, people that knew me, including family or friends, my life looked great. I was at the peak of my career. I had a great job as a business coach with a, a top university in the United Kingdom. I had the house, the car, the husband, you know, every kind of milestone on the road to success I had diligently ticked off. But inside there was just what I can only describe as a void. On the surface, everything was great, but underneath, I just didn't feel that fulfillment. I felt like I had, I had played my part in life. You know, I had showed up. I had done everything that, you know, I was meant to do. And yet I kind of suffered under the silent struggle of being fine and busy and okay and just ticking along and getting through my weeks. And at night I would go to bed and I would just feel like this. It was like my heart silently whispering, not my head, not the logic, but my heart would just say, is this it? Is this really all there is to life? It was that repeated call to, is there a different way to live that really prompted my journey? That's incredible. Let's, I want to dig into that for a minute because I feel like those are the people I'm talking to. Like it, it excites me because you're exactly like the person that you were in 2016. Everything looks good on paper. Everything is, is, you know, you're checking all the boxes from the outside looking in. You're happy. Like, why would you ever want to make a move, let alone a drastic move and, and change your life? 
looking back, have you been able to identify what was missing or, or if you were able to articulate it? I think it's, it's a very common feeling, but it's a really hard thing to put into words. I think if I was able to articulate it, what was missing for me was a deep understanding about life, what life was really about. I think for me, I'd always focused on the destination. Where was I going next? Looking for goal after goal, promotion after promotion, just on that kind of constant hamster wheel. And every time I got to my destination, climbed to the top of that mountain, put my flag in and felt like, yes, I'm here another mountain would appear in the distance. And I'd be like, oh, okay, maybe it's over there. So I take my flag out and then I climb back down and I climb another mountain. I was just tired. I just felt genuinely exhausted from life. And I looked at other people around me who just seemed happy with everything they had. And truthfully, I doubted myself a lot. I just thought, what is wrong with you, Sarah? You know, why do you want more all the time? When is life just going to be good enough for you? And I think looking back, the problem was I had strayed out of my own flow of life and into other people's currents. And I was chasing their goals. I looked at what made other people happy and I mimicked them and I mimicked their success. And gradually I just lost who I was as a person and what I valued from life. So you obviously made a decision to leave that life. I want to kind of get into how you got there and what the reaction was, but just talk about what that decision was because you didn't just quit your job and and stay home and with your circle of friends and kind of play it safe and figure it out, did you? No, <laughs> no, not at all. Um, the decision was was gradual. It started, as I said, from a place of there has to be more to life than this. And the more I, rather than trying to avoid that question, the more I turned, like, lent into that question and tried to look for answers, the more it prompted me along the journey. So first of all, it started with maybe I could go part time. Um, maybe we could downsize the house and use some of the savings to set up a business, you know. And the more I kind of experimented with those ideas in my head, the more it just drew me to this isn't something that I can just make a small adjustment to this has to be a big change and I have to go all in. And I remember it, the moment distinctly when I had kind of made the decision in my head, I was um, with my husband. We had taken our first holiday in seven years by ourselves, which is ridiculous. I can't even believe we let it go on that long. And we were in Thailand and we were lying on the beach. And I remember saying, what if we just sold everything? What if we just sold everything and gave it a go? Give it a go just to, to travel and work full time. What if we just did that? And it started almost as a joke between us, but then gradually we became more and more serious about it. And in the December, that was in the August, by the December, we had fully committed to the decision that that's what we were going to do and went home over Christmas. I don't know why I timed it over Christmas to tell our families that that, that was our move. Everyone's together. It's efficient. I, I love that timing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't easy, that part. I think the excitement in, in our heads of the possibilities was met with people's need for certainty and logic, which I didn't have. I can only describe the feeling as in knowing that it was right. It it wasn't logical when I tried to say to people, you know, when people ask me, what's your plan? What are you going to do? They wanted everything in concrete and I, I didn't have it. I just said, I just know this is something that I want to do. I know this is something that I want to try. I know this is a risk that I'm willing to take because even if it falls flat on its face, I will be happy that I tried. But people don't like those answers. <laughs> it makes them feel nervous for you. And I think people honestly felt I was having some form of midlife crisis or, or mental breakdown. So your husband, I want to talk about that relationship a little bit. It, was he feeling the same way in his career? Did he have a career? Because four months going from, oh, this is like, obviously when you're in the moment laying on the beach in Thailand, you're together. It's like, do we have to go home? Like, I think that's a very common thought and kind of common joke, but how did it get so serious so fast? Was he feeling the same way you were about it? it had you discussed it before? Or was this literally like the first time you'd kind of articulated like, this just sucks. Why are we doing this? 
Yeah, we discussed it before, you know, normally kind of like over dinner or just kind of casually or we, you know, be watching some form of inspirational program or listening to a really great podcast where we heard other people doing it and it would crop up in conversation that way. But I think in the year and a half build up to that point, we were both definitely struggling. He had a really successful career as well, but both of us just didn't have that that fulfillment that we needed. We just felt constantly busy, always on the go. Our diaries were always filled. And yet when we looked back over the years to what we had done or achieved, it wasn't necessarily the right things. It wasn't the contents of a meaningful life. It was decisions that were based out of guilt and obligation and people pleasing and saying yes. And I think we both felt that we were in a constant state of denying ourselves happiness by being true to what we wanted. We were just trying to fit ourselves in this little box of conformity and be the people that everybody else wanted us to be and have the the stable life and the stable background. I think you articulate that really well. You mentioned some of the the feelings and people wanted a plan, I'm assuming, especially your parents, you have siblings, like the people closest to you are like, well, how are you going to, how are you going to eat? What are you going to do? But how did you deal with the the other naysayers and did it make you question your decision? Obviously it was, it was a huge help to have your, your partner and spouse who's giving up the same amount of stuff, be on that same page and you're in it together. But how did you handle that? I'm assuming there was doubt or question or a lot of anxiety around, it feels good, but it doesn't make sense in my head. How do you rationalize those two opposites? Honestly, I, I really think the decision was much easier to make than the process of handling other people's reactions and my reaction to their reaction. I don't think I handled it particularly well at points. I think I expected people to hug me and congratulate me and tell me that I was brave and encourage me and send me positively on my way. But actually the reaction was the opposite. It was either silence because people didn't know what to say or didn't want to say what they truly felt. That was probably mainly the reaction from family or resistance of people feeling quite confused I think better that we were willing just to leave our lives. You know, we had really, really great friends in the area that we lived. And here we were saying, actually, we don't want this anymore. And I think to a certain extent, some people maybe find it insulting that we were saying, this life isn't, this life that you're leading isn't good enough for us. And those questions and their reactions were caused a huge amount of self doubt, pulled friendships into question, brewed quite a bit of resentment on on my part, just because I really felt at that stage that I was already exposed. You know, here I was, I felt like I was almost kind of like naked to the world, just standing there saying, this is the real me. These are my dreams. And people were just laughing at me or turning away in disgust and didn't get it. And it was really raw vulnerability. Um, and it caused a huge amount of self-doubt huge amount of self-doubt. It's amazing what happens when people move boldly and unapologetically towards the things that they want and how people are offended by what that means to their status quo. And it doesn't make any sense. I think I'm happy to know that, that you guys actually made that move. But for anybody else out there that's, that's considering something, whether it's this kind of shift or something different, if you're bold and you're, you're 100% in on what you're doing, if it, if it doesn't make sense to people, if they can't see it, it says a lot more about them and, and their blockers and how they can't see alternatives than it does about your decision. So so please, if that happens to you, don't internalize it. And Sarah, I'm thrilled to hear that you and your husband did not internalize it and you you made that decision. You did leave. So what did you do for work those first few months? Where'd you go? Like what happened next? So after a series of um I think you call them like garage sales in the States. So after a selling all our stuff, the car, the house, everything. We headed off to our first stop was Malaysia. We went to a little island there with no roads, no Wi-Fi, just beach and jungle and beach huts. And we stayed there for three weeks, purely with the intention of doing nothing other than recovering from the stress and kind of the the turmoil of our decision and, and getting grips with our new life. It was there that 
we met actually a, a guy. He was the first person that we met who was a true digital nomad that led in this location independent lifestyle. And he gave us some tips on what to do. You know, maybe we could try blogging. We could do a bit of selling on Amazon. We could do some copywriting. He told us, you know, the main hangouts in Southeast Asia where a lot of digital nomads were, how we could get, you know, in touch with that community. And that's really what we did for the first six months was a lot of experimenting, a lot of trial and error, a lot of being willing to feel fast and feel forward. And I learned so much from those experiences. I connected with so many incredible people who have been living this lifestyle for one year, five years, you know, 15 years in some cases. And it was just, it it was incredible. It was scary and it was amazing. And, And it really opened my eyes to how many possibilities there are in life when it comes to a career and finding a way to do work that you truly love. I love that. Just for context, without getting into numbers, how much how much runway did you guys have? You sold everything, you were out, like you're doing this for six months. How much time did you have before? I'm sure there was like a break glass plan of like, oh crap, I guess we have to go home and maybe get jobs again. Like how much time did you have to kind of figure this out and what did you need to earn in a normal month to feel like, okay, you know, we're we're still on track here. I think For contextualizing that decision, the amount of money that you need to earn and how long you had to figure it out is really, really important. Yeah, and that's that's a huge reason for for picking Southeast Asia, which a lot of location independent people do choose that reason and choose that location in particular. Chiang Mai in Thailand, in the north of Thailand, is a huge hotspot for digital nomads. They run a a digital nomad summit every year. It's a city, but it's got great Wi-Fi, you know, really strong connections. They run free workshops there all the time. But more importantly, as a startup who's trying to bootstrap their business and trying to f- like figure out their way as they go, the cost of living is really low. So to give listeners just an example of, of the costs that were involved, we lived in a like a one bedroom apartment in a really nice complex with a swimming pool and gym and jacuzzi and that costs us around 300 us dollars a month all in all right i'm booking a flight <laughs> yeah you know, right it's, it's pretty amazing you could eat you know anything from kind of like one dollar upwards a meal a day so realistically between the two of us if we managed it really well we could live and survive comfortably of six hundred seven hundred dollars a month so it meant then that the money we had to bring in wasn't we weren't under that huge financial financial pressure we'd sold our stuff we had some money there that we were willing and able to dip into savings but ultimately we could cover our costs if if between the two of us we could bring in seven hundred dollars a month through doing a little bit of consultancy work you know a little bit of work on fiverr or upwork or whatever that was and um, that would cover our costs and that would be enough to kind of prevent us from dipping in savings. Obviously, the goal is to earn a lot more than that and to have the financial freedom that you can travel the world and be anywhere in the world. And I think two years on, we're gradually, we, we are at that stage where I'm currently in, in Copenhagen in Denmark at the minute, which is not a cheap city. I don't know. It's one of the more expensive places in the, in the world, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Yeah. That's awesome. So the first couple of months you were kind of bootstrapping and figuring it out. You're, you're meeting other digital nomads hanging out in the beauty that is Thailand. I've never been to Thailand, but the amount of people I meet on Upwork that are doing projects are like, Oh, I'm in, I'm in Peru. I'm in Thailand. I'm just like, this is a whole, a whole nother level. But so you did that for a couple of months. You were meeting people, figuring it out. What was, I mean, if you were to pick that one thing going in, what type of business was it consulting or, or obviously you had this background Did you try to do your expertise in corporate, did you try to bring that into full-time entrepreneurship in a digital capacity or were you looking at doing something totally different? Well, you would think that would make logical sense, wouldn't you? But no, I decided not to do that <laughs> at, at the start. I think I just was so confused about what was making me unhappy or not fulfilled in life. And I'd sort of tarnished my career with the same brush. And the reason I went back to it was I went to a workshop that was being run in Thailand by a coach. And it was meant to be around the mindset of self-esteem. And when I went, it was the worst workshop I've ever been to in my life. It was packed. It was horrible. She had people 
running fridge magnets over their heads and claiming that this released their their negative energy. <laughs> it was full of awful science and bad psychology. And I remember thinking, oh, Sarah, by you leaving what you truly love and what you've trained in and have a decade of experience in, you've created a space for people like this with with bad intentions, with the, a lack of expertise to to take your place. And I remember walking home that night and the next day I started an Instagram account called The Power to Reinvent. And it was just like that. I just instantly knew in the same way I knew I had to leave. I knew that I had to go back. And actually the other steps that I'd taken through teaching myself how to blog through doing a bit of, you know, work and consultancy work online by teaching myself search engine optimization, all those things sort of beautifully came together that enabled me to set up this, this platform and start blogging and getting my message out there of something I was truly passionate about. It's amazing. I talk about it all the time. I'm sure frequent listeners are sick of hearing me say it, but I always talk about, we don't, you're not going to see the path until you're on the journey. And I'm assuming just by listening to you talk that like, there's no way in the world, like you, you almost went through this entire mindset cleanse of we're just going to get out of here, do nothing, flush out all this toxicity, figure out what it is that I don't like, and then figure it out. And along the path of figuring it out, it brought you back to a different way to do what you were passionate about from the beginning. 100%. That is so perfectly put. I'm sitting here with like, like goosebumps because it's just, it's the coolest thing in the world. So you're two years into this now. You got your mojo back. What's been the best thing about this experience? If you were to, to, I'm sure there's multiple, but if you had to pick one, what would it be? Being myself, being authentically, fully myself and knowing who, who I am, which sounds like the strangest thing to say. And, and in some ways, I've sort of come back to, oh, these elements of my personality were me at the time. I was just a bit confused or, but I really feel like I'm living from a place of authenticity. I feel like my life has meaning and fulfillment and I no longer search for happiness. I'm no longer on that hamster wheel. Even the way that I run my business, it's gradual. I just enjoy the process. It's the smallest things like, I notice how when I wake up in the morning, there's a smile on my face. You know, like when you just wake from your sleep, there's just like this little smile and I'm just happy, just genuinely happy. But I think happy is a wrong word. I think it's more content. I'm just really content with where I am. I'm really loving being on this journey and feeling like I'm living a meaningful and fulfilled life. Truly. Man. I mean, that's, that's about the definition of success. If you ask me, it's just, it's to be able to be authentically you and do the things that fire you up in the places you want to be and work with the types of people you want to, that, that is my definition of success. That's why I do what I do. That's why I do this show to help people understand through stories like yours, that there are other options. Like you are not stuck. (laughs) You don't have to have this angst constantly and just, you know, hold up your house or your car or your vacation that you take, you know, once every seven years and say, well, this is worth it. What would you say to the people that that are inspired by this? And just, they, they're not really there yet. They're probably where you were maybe a couple of years before you made the decision that they want it, but they can't see it. What would you say? I would say when you receive that call, that you're not on the right path, you need to answer it. It's there for a reason. It's showing up for a reason. Lean into it. Trust the process. And the beauty of your journey is you don't see all the answers yet because you don't, you won't want to. When you take that call and when you embark on the journey and when you really align with your purpose and you move forward each day, just kind of following that bliss and, and carving out your own path, the journey unfolds in the most beautiful, unexpected, challenging, incredible ways. And hand on heart, I feel like I have lived more in these two years than I did in the previous four that I would say I wasn't particularly happy. Man, that's awesome. Looking back now, you're a couple of years into this. Is, is there anything 
anything at all. You can go back pre-2016 if you need to, but what would you do differently going back, knowing what you know now? I would stop comparing myself to others. (laughs) I think um, I look around me far too often to what other people's definition of success was and tried to copy and mimic it rather than finding my own path. I would be more vulnerable and honest with how I was feeling. I think I silently struggled under fine and busy. I wasn't happy, but I didn't know how to communicate that to other people because everything was fine. You know, I wasn't depressed. I wasn't anxious. I was, I didn't need to see a doctor. I was none of those things, but I didn't know how to say to my friends that I wasn't fulfilled. And because I didn't know how to communicate that, I resisted that and just tried to fill the void or numb it out with, with anything that I could. And I think back then the change would have been brought about a lot quicker for me if I just had a leaned into those feelings of what made me uncomfortable and maybe tried to articulate how I was feeling a bit better with other people. Because the irony is now, now that I'm kind of, you know, have gone through that journey and shared my journey very openly along the way, I hear so many other people open up then about, I feel the same way. I don't feel fulfilled. I just go through the motions of life. And I think there is a huge swathe of of people of busy professionals and good jobs that on the surface look like they have life figured out who who just have that empty void and that lack of fulfillment. That's amazing. No, I love it. You're you're like my new poster child. Like everything you just said is what I try to to pull out and the people I try to kind of inspire with this content and and the show and all the work I do is really to help people see it's not if if it's just fine, that's not good enough. And you can have it all how do you do that? And how do you take the blinders off and start moving down that path before you see the, the full path? Absolutely. And it's, it is not an easy journey. It's not for the faint hearted. It will test you. But I always remember I, just before I left, a friend of mine brought me um, The Alchemist, the, the infamous book. And there was one line in it and it said that the universe will conspire to help you. And I truly believe that on this journey, the more that I showed up for my purpose and the more I aligned with it, just the universe did, you know, people presented themselves at the right times, you know, opportunities appeared two years down the line. I'm now writing a book, which was like my ultimate dream from when I was 10 years old, you know, and there's days like I was in Copenhagen yesterday in this beautiful museum with my laptop, you know, writing. And and it was almost like a pinch me moment where I was like, this is really my life. Like, this is it. Oh, I just wish the the me two years ago, if I had have gone back to that poor little, you know, courageous but but terrified girl and said, you're going to be okay. Look what's ahead of you. I don't think she would have ever believed it. That's so, so cool. So you're still traveling. You're working on the book. What's the next 12 months hold for you and, and what else are you working on business-wise? Yeah, so I'm in the process of finishing the book, um, which is due to be published and not until January 2020, but um, the promotion of that will start a lot sooner. So I'm, I'm working on that. That's been my main focus for the past little while. I'm just in the process of redeveloping my website. And then my plan is to launch a lot more digital online products. So at the minute, it involves mainly me in a one-to-one capacity. But I want to have products that enable me to better serve my clients so that they don't need me and they can go on a workshop or complete a course or whatever it is that they need to do that best sits their busy lives and equally serves my purpose of having more freedom so the business becomes less reliant on me and I can travel more and experiment more with my likes. I continually with the business have to come back to a place to remind myself why I'm doing it. Again, it's a whole different set of challenges. You see, you know, other people who run similar businesses, who are constantly on the go, who, you know, are running retreats and have masterminds and have a million different things. And I don't want to get caught up in that comparison again. So I just, every time I make a business decision, I come back to, will this give me more freedom? And will this align with the life that I want to lead and I want others to lead? So every business decision over the next 12 months is coming from that place. That's absolutely a great piece of advice. And 
man, I'm excited to read the book. I'm excited to see what you do next because this story has inspired me already. We play a little game called Rapid Fire. Rapid Fire is brought to you by Podigy. If you're a podcaster and sick of spending hours doing your own editing and your own show notes, do what I do and just hire Podigy and tell them Nick Murphy sent you. All right, Sarah, are you ready to play Rapid Fire? I'm nervous, but I'm ready. I don't know that you have one, but what do you think about when you're alone in your car? I don't have a car, but I do have a bicycle in Copenhagen. What do I think about my book predominantly at the minute? <laughs> um, the little genius of inspiration tends to appear when I'm on my bicycle or somewhere away from a pen. So I normally have a little thought and I think that's great. And then I, I frantically try to hold it in my head until I can get home or at least get to a bit of paper. So definitely random thoughts on, on how to find your flow. <laughs> or quotes or words that will just join that sentence perfectly tend to come into my head when I'm, when I'm on my bicycle in Copenhagen. What's your advice for your previous boss? Listen, listen to the feedback of those who are doing the work on the ground and take learning and insight from that. What do you want to be when you grow up? An author. I want to write more. I want to write more books. What inspires you? Life. Every day in the biggest ways and the most simplest ways. Yeah. Just the ability to open my eyes to, to the incredibleness that surrounds us. I think all too often we can get sucked into the negativity of what is on the news or what horror is kind of happening or what political leaders are doing X, Y, and Z. But I think there's so many beautiful stories every day that surround us that, that just show the incredibleness of of life for all of for all that it is what is your biggest fear my biggest fear is regret and i don't mean that in i know that we'll all have some form of regret but regret that i didn't take life and live it to the fullest I, i want when i when it's my time i want to close my eyes and just check out knowing you rocked it you showed up. You did the best that you did. You had some crazy experiences. Yeah. Who do you admire the most? Elizabeth Gilbert, who is the author of most famously kind of known for Eat, Pray, Love. I think her, her writing style, but also her vulnerability to really share her stories of her, her life has been quite dramatic and full of many, many very different chapters. And I love her ability to, to turn that pain often that she has gone through into beautiful lessons that other people can connect with and take learning from. Which celebrity annoys you the most? No names in particular, but any of those reality stars that promote terrible products on their Instagram. I just think that is such a waste. <laughs> of a voice on social media. Damn influencer marketing. Damn it. <laughs> yeah. Those bloody teas. Like, of course, if you drink tea, you're going to lose like five pounds if that's all you're consuming. Yeah, it drives me crazy. How do you define success? Fulfillment and knowing that you're worthy enough. I think at the core, under everything, when you strip back every single layer is the fear or the feeling that you're not worthy, that even when you go on the journey, that no matter what success you have, that you're not worthy to receive it. So I think success is feeling worthy and fulfilled in life, no matter what you do, whether that is you're a gardener or you're a speaker worldwide, or you're a CEO of a massive company, or you're a cleaner, it doesn't matter what you do. If you feel worthy and fulfilled, you are successful. All right, last one. You get to share a drink or a meal with anyone in history, dead or alive. Who is it and why? I would pick Vincent Van Gogh, dead, obviously. Um, I would pick him purely because he, he was incredible in his work. And I recently have just come back from Paris where I'm, I went to an incredible exhibition of his. And he painted even though he only ever sold one painting in his lifestyle, in his lifetime. I would love a meal with him to tell him the impact that he had on the world, the impact that he never knew that he had. All right. That's it. You survived rapid fire. Congratulations, Sarah. Thanks. (laughs) They were good questions. They were hard. 
Sarah Hart. We have fun with it. It's it's one of my favorite segments. Before I let you go, what's your number one parting piece of advice for, let's say, the listener out there who's in the same place you were in 2015? My biggest piece of advice would be follow your heart. Trust that feeling of knowing that you're on the right path and forget the plan. Just forget the plan. Just trust your gut and follow your intuition. It will lead you to incredible places. Man, I love that. I could talk to you for hours. If you're ever in the States, let me know because we're going to we're gonna have a very long tea or coffee or whatever the, or beer or something. But uh, definitely amazing story. And I love that you, I love that you did it. I always, always looking for people that made those big moves that figured it out. And I mean, the most impactful thing you said to me that if I were a listener and I were considering this or it sounds good, but, 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 and like all the things go off in our head about, you know, it's not logical and what would people say and what would I do if, and all those fears that, that are natural, you wake up with a smile on your face every morning. I mean, what else is there? What else is there? So thank you so much. I know Copenhagen and Nebraska have some different time zones. So I appreciate you being flexible with my recording schedule. And I absolutely love the conversation. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you for this platform and for taking responsibility to, to share this message with so many people. It's, it's incredible work that you do. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Sarah Gregg. Pretty inspiring stuff, if you ask me. Digital Nomad just seems really, really cool. I'd never actually spoken to anyone who would live that life. And so it was really fascinating to hear kind of what that experience was like and just literally starting with a clean slate. What are you going to do? What do you need to learn? And then going and doing it anywhere in the world is just pretty fascinating and, and inspiring stuff. To access all the resources that Sarah and I discussed in this episode, head over to nickmurphy.io and just press the podcast tab. I just told you what I thought of the episode. I'd love to know what you thought as well. And the best way to do that is to write a review directly in iTunes or whichever app you use to listen to this podcast. I read each and every one. And in addition to sharing your thoughts and feedback directly with me, those reviews really help the show gain visibility and allow other people to discover the show. It's a really noisy world out there. You solopreneurs know this. So if you did enjoy the episode, please make sure to subscribe, rate, and review it for me. It only takes a minute and it means the absolute world to me. So thank you in advance. Always remember, trading time for money is no way to live. You deserve to live life on your terms and building a lifestyle business is the fastest, safest, best way to do just that. Thanks for being here and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Building a Lifestyle Business Podcast. To access the resources mentioned in this episode, visit www.nickmurphy.io 